All right. So we are ready with our next speaker, Jeff Foley, uh, who's going to be speaking about unlocking the power of OWASP AMAS, uh, introducing the open asset management to model tool uh, for comprehensive uh, track surface mapping. Uh, about him, he's a VP for uh, uh, Zero, is VP for research at ZeroFox, founder and leader of the famous OWASP AMAS uh, flagship project. He's also been a speaker at Recon Village previously. So let's give him a round of applause. All right, can everyone hear me? Oh, great. All right, yeah, real quick. <clears throat> How many people here have already used a mask before? I'm just curious what, all right, look at that. Look at all those hands, I love it. All right, so we've got some great things to uh, share with you though this year. But getting started, <clears throat> how many people just feel like they want to take more control over this, their recon process, right? I uh, personally have been seeing a, so many of these scripts that <clears throat> are showing the sequential process of seed a, a tool, uh, <laughs> take the output data, clean it up, put it into a text file, do it, you know, take that, seed another tool. It's like, it's, it's a mess, right? <clears throat> it's, you're probably losing a lot of the data it doesn't seem very organized or well managed. And I just feel like, hasn't recon grown up, right? Like, aren't we more mature than this? I feel like we definitely have gotten to a point where we deserve more control, more management, more organization around what we're doing. Does anyone disagree with me? Or how many people would love to see this happen? All right, we good, good, good. good. <clears throat> All right, so that's what I want to talk uh, about today. But real quick, uh, I guess I'm, uh, she already did such a great job introducing me, so I guess I don't need to say too much about myself, but yes, uh, I'm the project leader for OWASP Amass. I'm also on the project committee, a uh, wonderful organization that is here for you. We are trying to empower more people every, everywhere when it comes to security. I've been doing this kind of work for a very long time. Uh, I learned a lot of it on this bottom bullet where you can see I did offensive cyber warfare research and development where I kind of le learned the tricks of the trade. I took some of these, uh, I'll say, attempts to fill the gap of understanding your attack surface uh, to the energy industry, to the financial industry, where they desperately seem to uh, need visibility on their attack surface. I've also brought this to so many other clients uh, privately, which you would perhaps think would have this under control or you know, have mature programs that would have better visibility on this, but the answer is not a single one I've ever worked with said, oh good, we, we, we expected exactly that, you can leave. Uh, it was hardly, hardly the case. <clears throat> not even the ones I kind of hoped would say that. Uh, I am at uh, Zero Fox now. Part of the reason for that is ZeroFox has so many clients that you know gives me me incredible visibility on what's going on out there. Uh, the challenges they face with external cybersecurity are right in line with what I've been bringing to you for years now, and uh, it just makes it so that I feel like I can bring even greater value to this community by working there. So I love I love working there. Uh, if you want to reach me to talk to me about anything related to reconnaissance, use these socials. Reach out anytime. Feel free to engage. All right, so I guess I don't really need this slide, uh, or at least not too much, since most, pe most people here seem quite aware of what this is. But AMAS is a flagship project, and it's about in-depth attack surface uh, mapping and asset discovery. It's about understanding what you have out there. What do you have exposed on the internet as part of the contested environment that we all deal with, right? By being part of the, in or in on the internet, forgive me. <clears throat> it was a tool. I hope you'll know by the time this talk is done, it's not really just a tool anymore. It's more like a framework. And we're really more focused these days on attack surface intelligence collection and making the data easy for you to work with. That's, that's my goal that I'm gonna keep pushing in this project. It's also a goal that's been shared with OWASP and they're quite excited about because we want it to be more about the data, about making it easy for you to work with it, you doing what you need to do with it, um, 
making people more aware of the problem, right? It's not just about uh, tooling. All right. If you want to get in touch with this project, you can use these socials. And of course, some of you are probably already familiar with these uh, links. Maybe the most important one, though, being the Discord at the bottom. If you're not part of this Discord, I would urge you, please become part of it. Bring all your questions and thoughts and ideas about this uh, to our Discord, because that's where the community uh, gets together around this. All right, a lot of people want to know, though, like, why did, why did you do this? Why, why did we need this? <clears throat> so, we need, I needed this initially because, as I was saying a moment ago, I was working with many clients trying to help them answer the question of how, what are their gaps, where should they be investing for next year's uh, security budget, what do they need to be focused on, things like that. And since I didn't want to just be another voice in the room, I wanted to show, some, so show them something real, I was bringing them uh, concrete data of what they looked like on the internet and trying to raise the question of, is this what you expect it to look like? Do you think that's a good idea that you have that exposed? Do you know what that would look like to, through the attacker lens? <clears throat> and I found this to be far more effective than just sitting there and being, like I said, another voice in the room and saying, ah, I think you know, I would advocate that you do this with your money. So it's, it, um, it, was, it was effective, but it needed to be easy, right? Like for me also, because I was doing this quite frequently and I didn't really want to sit here doing it manually all the time. But also, <clears throat> when this became more about, so when I saw that this wasn't a one-off problem, where all these companies were having this problem, and I asked myself, well, what are we going to do about it? The way I saw it was we needed to raise awareness around this, but part of that needed to be that if they said, well, I don't know if we have the resources to address this, or we, we have the people that know how to do this like you do, I wanted to be able to say, and you don't need it because there's a tool right here that will do it automatically for you. The, you, the person doesn't need to know pretty, barely anything about it, and you'll get the answers anyway, or you'll get the data that you need. So the purpose of the tool initially really was to make it so these people almost had to address this problem. They had to wake up to what, what was going on. And it turned into, I, I guess I would say, much more, since many people seem to like it. But it really was kind of, in my mind, more focused on these organizations that needed to open their eyes to uh, the gap that they were dealing with. All right, getting to the more interesting things. <clears throat> so last year, I was at this very village at, uh, on Nahamsek's panel discussion for attack surface management. Was anyone in this room at that panel discussion by chance? All right, look at that, we got one person. Anybody else? All right, because <clears throat> something kind of important happened uh, during that talk. Now, Hamsek said, should an attack surface just be IT assets and internet infrastructure? And I was kind of uh, quick to say, no, I don't think so. I think it should be anything that is relevant to a security program that can be discovered on the internet. And I think it, it should, and that's a lot of things, right? I mean, that, there's a lot of things out there that could fall into that uh, definition. And we talked about it for a while, but I kind of put the stake in the ground at that point and said, well, as far as a mass is concerned or the project is concerned, we're broadening the definition as of today. Right? Like I, and I meant it, like w we are going to start working towards being able to include anything that is relevant to a security program, not just what we cover currently. Well, <clears throat> excuse me. Like I said, I took that quite seriously. I wasn't kidding. And, uh, but what, so what did we do about it? Or what, what have we done since I was here last time? We realized in order to honor that promise or work towards that promise, we were going to need to uh, be able to represent many more asset types than we currently do, right? Uh, we were gonna need this data model capable of uh, being very quick to add new new types, new relationships between the types. If it took too long to do this or it was too cumbersome, this just wasn't going to work. And it was too cumbersome at the time that this happened. So this was uh, quite a task uh, for us. And 
that a year ago, the database we were using was, it made it impossible for any of you to just say, I have a different use case, I have a different way I'd like to query this data, and I want to pull it out my way or you know, ask different questions. You couldn't do that. If, if a mass didn't support it for you, then you weren't getting it, right? And I hated that. <clears throat> and it wasn't going to work for this if we started collecting even more and people had new creative ways they wanted to use it. So it, it uh, caused the open asset model to be created. Now, let me say real quick, there's no way this would have happened if this was just me doing it. There are some people who made this possible that deserve to be, <laughs> deserve credit. Uh, Zero Fox saw this vision as making perfect sense. They thought this is exactly what the community needs and that that's just good for everybody. They, they believed in, in what I said at, at uh, this conference last year. And they put a lot of resources against this. They had full, you know, like six engineers working full time for two quarters, director of architecture. I mean, they, they had quite a team working on this and they just donated it with no strings attached whatsoever to OWASP. They just said, here, have it. So to zero Fox, right? Like that was amazing. <clears throat> I would have, we, we wouldn't be able to talk about this right now if they hadn't uh, made that, you know, put all that energy behind it. And what was created, I gotta say, was exactly what I told them I needed too. It, it was this agile database that creates unified representation of these uh, assets on the internet and the relationships between them and this real world interconnectedness that we need to be able to represent between the assets. And we did get this uh, taxonomy and model that makes it so easy to add more to this that this can now be community driven and shaped by all of us from now on. Like we got this started so that it's capable, uh, it now is what a, ma a mass is using, but it's just the beginning because now there's so much more we can do with it. We also created uh, the database that implements this model. It currently is supported on SQL Lite. I would say for all of you that don't want to touch the database with a 10 foot pole, you just want to be able to have it thrown somewhere and start using it. We didn't forget it about all of you. Uh, but if you're serious about you, you really want to manage this, you want to put it in one central place and you want to be able to keep this for a very long time and work at high performance, Postgres is what I would recommend you use and we are supporting that as well. Um, it makes it possible now to be storing the data and pulling it out at the same time. So I can't tell you how many people have said to me, well, I can't access the data that um, Amass is collecting until it's finished, right? That was kind of, I, I imagine that must have been quite a problem for a lot of workflows. Well, it's not a problem anymore. These are all uh, able to be accessed concurrently you can be collecting the data and uh, analyzing it at the same time, uh, which I would think if I, if I was a user of this, I would be very happy about that. And it's all still in this graph-like structure that we used pre uh, previously, which makes this very easy to navigate and make use of, I would argue. Uh, at least personally, I'm pretty uh, set on having it that way, but in my defense, the director of architecture felt the same way who uh, reviewed all this and uh, like I said, actually built this. What this ends up looking like <clears throat> when you dive into the database and you wanna see, well, what, what did you guys actually create? Um, it's really simple by design. It's two tables, one with assets, one with relations between them, that's it. It's just what is out there and what's the glue between them. And most of it tied together with simple integers that make it extremely high performance and uh, easy to pull this data back out. So as I don't think this takes too much self, or you know, too much explain, uh, explanation, but if we find a DNS name, it goes in as a fully qualified domain name with an, a J, uh, all of it has, all of these things are represented as JSON so that each asset type could, can be unique in what we're saving about it, right? But the rows in the table are the same for everything. Meaning, like I said earlier, we could add a, a new asset type and it doesn't require one change whatsoever to this database, the schema. We just have the new asset type with the new JSON uh, format. So <clears throat> we have the DNS name with the name, we have the IP address with the address. 
it's a little bit more complicated than this. I've simplified it a little bit for this pr presentation, but you get the idea. Um, the relations are just the type of relation and what asset is it from and what is it pointing to, like an edge. And that's it, it glue, that glues everything together. All of this stuff has timestamps on it, so you can do some fun things like saying, show me only the things that are, you know, have been validated within the last week or whatever. Um, you can check easily for what's new versus what we've known about for quite a long time. I left all those things out so it would fit on this slide. But, as, as I said, by design, we're trying to keep this super simple. There's nothing in here other than what, what was found and how these things are glued together. That's how we wanted it, that's how it turned out. It makes it so that it's really pretty easy once you see how to go back and forth between the assets and the relations. Um, it's easy to make some powerful questions or ask powerful questions to this database. It's extremely extendable like I, I told them it needed to be. So we can create n new types, that's the point. So we can keep saying we want to represent more things, more things, more accurately, more, ac you know, that's the point. <clears throat> I'm very interested to see how everyone decides to start navigating or querying this information. I think you're gonna, f as you're gonna start finding things that you didn't realize you could find uh, when we're connecting all the dots in this database. The other thing I'm pretty excited about is Typically, people are rerunning these scans every time they have a different question they want answered, right? Wow, that is so noisy. I mean, I, so noisy. <clears throat> There's no need for this anymore, right? You can just dump all this into the OAM database and you can just start asking more questions. Unless you need to make sure that it's been validated again recently, that's really your only reason to be running the scans again is to make sure you've updated uh, the data. But you can ask the questions as many times as you want, navigate, peruse, whatever, uh, uh, your heart away. All right, so I've got a very simple demonstration to show you that this is quite real and not just uh, making this up. But let me just say real quick, this isn't to say that the tools you've come to like from a mass aren't still there. If you go to uh, our GitHub, OWASP Mass, OAM Tools, you'll find these three tools right currently. One called OAM Subs, the other one, another one OAM Viz, and another one called OAM Track. They're the, they're the same functions that we supported before. So that if you were, if you really loved these, then don't worry, they're still there. And we'll be coming out with more, I'm sure, in the future. This is, what I'm about to show you isn't to say that we won't create tools to help you with your typical use cases. What I want to show you is that if we d are not supporting, you know, we don't have a tool for what you need, don't let us slow you down. The whole, this is to empower everybody, make it so that you could write a script to pull the data you need and do what you need to do with it. It's to make this easier, even though th the queries might, you know, take you a little while to put put together. All right, so actually there's no keeping up with, you don't have to keep up with me in this demonstration, but if <clears throat> later when these slides are shared, uh, you'd like to reproduce everything that's been done here, or you just wanna be able to see that you can do what I did, I've got some instructions here to uh, make sure that you've got like the correct version of a mass, which needs to be pretty much the most recent version. Um, you know, make sure you have SQL, a recent version of SQL Lite, things like that. I would um, personally keep the data separate for your initial use of this because um, you don't want to be mixing it with data that you were collecting previously. They're not the same format, so just be careful with that. So I've got two different demonstrations I, were, I was gonna show. One being what I would call the easiest question you could possibly answer. What are the names that you found? Like, that's usually what people want, right? They run the tool and they say, just have it spit out the names. So I'm gonna show you how you can do that with SQL instead of relying on us to do it for you. 
I've got a more complicated example where we traverse more of the database where it takes the namespace that we're interested in and then says, now show me all the CIDR blocks that these names resolve into, which is often a question I hear people asking. So I'm going to show you how you can do that just with the SQL as well. All right. So hopefully this looks pretty simple to everybody. What we're seeing here is we're just saying, so remember earlier I said that we have JSON for every uh, row and every type of asset, right? So that's what content is in this case. So we're just saying select from the content the name uh, from the assets table where the type has to be fully qualified domain name and the name has to end with a wasp.org, right? Pretty simple. So if I take this, let's hope that I don't have any issues here. If I copy this, hopefully everyone can see that. Let me um, remove this. Can everyone see this? All right, good. So I'm already in a database, or sorry, I'm in a, I'm in a directory where there is a database where <clears throat> OWASP.org has been enumerated and it's saved, right? And it's already in this file called amass.sqlite, which is the default place it's going to put the data uh, if you're running a mass today, unless you tell it to use Postgres uh, instead. So if I fire off this uh, query, you get the names. Right? Straightforward. But what I wanted to show is that this is usually what everybody wants to know, what everybody would like to know. I wanted to show them how easy it is that you could just do it yourself if you like to. You don't need to have tooling around it to do it for you. The more complicated example is this one. <clears throat> Now, I would still argue it's not that complicated once you see what's happening here. Each, each time you want to go from an asset to a re relation back to another asset, you're going to do two of these joins. It's just the nature of how this is designed, right? So that you can connect the from asset ID on the relation to you, or typically that's where you would be coming from with the, uh, the initial asset. You'd be following the from asset ID across the relation, so to speak, and then to the to asset ID, which means it's pointing to that with the to asset ID. So here what we have is <clears throat> we say, well, we're going to print out unique CIDR blocks, right? That's what we're going to get from the nets table or information. So we start with fully qualified domain names. We use relations as rels1. We associate the ID from the name to the from asset ID. We connect assets again as IPs this time, and then say, and if the two asset ID matches the IP, then we're interested in it. We keep going, though. We, take, we uh, use relations again. We say if the IP, I, IP ID uh, matches the two asset ID. Now, the reason we're doing that instead is the taxonomy currently doesn't have outgoing relations or relationships for IP addresses. They're only incoming. Uh, like in this case, it's the net block contains the IP address. So it's the net block that has the from asset ID. So here we see IP ID equals to asset ID. We join again with nets or assets as nets where rels to from asset ID is the net block or the nets ID. And then we do our filtering where we say for rels1, we want to make sure the type is either the A record or the quad A record. And rels2 needs to be contains. I just explained why um, a moment ago. I threw in this uh, helpful filter where I demonstrate how you can filter by time. So if you want to say it's got to be something we've validated within the, the past week, you know, you can do that. It's easy enough. For the asset uh, types, we want to say fully qualified domain names need to be FQDN. The IPs need to be the IP address. The nets need to be the net block. 
straightforward. And then finally, the fully qualified domain names need to end in OWASP.org so that this is all relevant to you know, what we were asking about, which is OWASP.org. So it's a, bit, it's a bit much, but if you take the time to craft these things and put them into your script, you don't have to touch them again necessarily, and now you can pull this data out anytime you want. And like I've said before, it's the way you want to do it. But let me quickly demonstrate that this actually works. And it doesn't like me. Oh, I see. So I must have copied it wrong. We'll try again. And there we have it. We have. The four net blocks or CIDR range, you know, CIDR uh, blocks that these names resolve into. Easy enough, quick, but potentially powerful if, if that's what you're interested in finding out. The purpose, of course, not being that I think this is what everyone needs to know, it's more to demonstrate that you can find out pretty much anything you want to know. This is the, the point, I would say. All right, so what, what does this mean for all of us, or what, why am I promoting this? <clears throat> so getting on, literally kind of getting on the soapbox here, I'm just, I just think we, we need to be, like I said at the beginning, more organized about this, right? We need, to, we need to have a unified way to communicate about this. We need to have expectations around what kind of data we're collecting for these different asset types. There needs to. There needs to be a way to say, if I'm looking for this information and I ask you for it, I can expect it's going to uh, be these things you're going to tell me, not a spreadsheet that hopefully will have what I'm looking for, maybe, uh, on a lucky day. So, and, and I don't like this sequential process we're using where the first tool gets the fewer, the, the least number of seeds and as you keep going, tools get more seed data and more, it's like, I don't know, it's, it's, I hope I'm not the only one that feels disappointed by how this is being done. But if we use this hub and spoke approach where we're all, all of this is going into the OAM and all the questions are being answered from the OAM, there would be no, no need to have this clunky sequential process where we're potentially losing data along the way. Each tool, could contribute the data to the OAM and everything it has to offer. That's the other thing. We're losing a lot of valuable data from these tools by executing them this way. But if each one was designed to say, here's what I do, here's what I'm going to go out and get, and I'm going to put all of that into the OAM, they could all be running uh, potentially in concurrently or in parallel and giving all their value to the database. I see this as way more powerful, both for tool developers and for the people using the tools. And it makes it easier for everyone to be contributing to this, right? We could have 50 different tools being used potentially. It doesn't really matter as long as all the data is going back into one place and everyone's accurately reporting what they're finding. Then your question could be answered by 50 tools instead of three that you feel fairly confident about or whatever it is that exactly that you do. But I see this as more powerful than what we do currently. I also think, I said a moment ago, some of these tools are getting seeded with more of the what's been collected so far than others. Why do that when they all could retrieve from the database to seed, I'll call it equally, all of them can do their discovery process. All of them can store back into the same place. And from the data in the database, we could then notify of what is new to uh, what, what we understand about the, I'll call it target. But this is a better model. It's also not just my idea. I, I, I'm pretty sure it's safe to say that like Haddix has promoted this. I believe Nahamsek has promoted this. 
I think a lot of us have been saying, this is a better approach to handling this than the way many people are doing it currently. So I'm just on the same bandwagon and I feel like the OAM is only gonna make it easier for everybody. I'm pretty excited uh, because of that promise I mentioned in, at the beginning that we're just kind of, we're just getting started, right? We, we just got this working in time to bring it to you today. I mean, we were, we got the uh, version 4.0 out, I believe in July. We are testing it like crazy, you know, putting fixes out. It, it just was enough so that you can run a mass as you knew it before, but with the OAM now. But that's not where this, that's not the end. It's just the beginning. It's that now we have the data model to support the promise, which was now we're going to add more and more to this data model. And we are going to have, um, I'm not sure what's going on with that. Apologies for that, I'm not sure what, what that was about. But, so we're gonna have more, um, more asset types, more relationships between them. For instance, personally, I'm pretty excited about quickly adding TLS certificates and JARM fingerprints. I can't wait to have the new uh, identifier for these assets. I'm excited about what we're going to connect when we have this additional identifier. Um, but th that's just one or two things, right? What's it, what's it gonna look like when we start adding email addresses and individuals and organizations and, and employees? And it's gonna get crazy and really fun, I think, <laughs> to be doing this. And like I said, you're going to be able to collect all this, I would say, much more quietly and then have all the fun you want perusing the data and, and coming up with uh, your findings from your recon activities. This is, this feels like the dream, right? And this is what I'm trying to give to everybody. This is where I'm trying to take this. And it's all for the community. There's, there's no strings attached here. This is OWASP, right? We want everyone involved. I want everyone's ideas. Come bring it to the Discord to let us know where you want to see this go, or what, what you want to see, how you want to see us shape this, right? We're listening. We're reaching out to other organizations as well who ha are known for producing this kind of information, and they're starting to sign up. They want to export the data in this format. They want to be involved. They want to be chiming in on what is this going to look like. But now is the time, if you're interested, to get involved and put your two cents in, because we're going to start modeling everything that's relevant to security that's found on the internet. And that's what I have.